Hey everyone, welcome to church. My name is Carla and I'm up here with Mark and KJ and the band, my friends, and it's so good to be with you here in this place. And if you're watching online, we're so glad you're joining us. This is a great way to start off our week. In fact, I cannot think of a better way to start out my week than being here in church. This is a place where when my week gets crazy and hectic, I can find rest and peace right here. This is a place where I can fight my battles that go on in my mind that I wrestle with through the week. God says he wants to meet you right where you're at, and that means you don't have to have it all together or know all the answers, but he says to come just as you are, and he will meet you where you're at. And that's worth singing about. So would you guys please stand with us, and let's worship together. Let's lift our voices to our great God. He's worthy. Here we go. Hey!
just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven One touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that I God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that I God can do. Amen. Just one word. Praise the 
Well, hey, everybody, it's great to have you join us here uh, in person at the Lionel Lace Campus and online. Once again, welcome. Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Andrew. I'm the campus pastor here at the Lionel Lakes campus. And in just a minute, we're gonna have the opportunity uh, to hear from our senior pastor, Jason Strand, as we're continuing wrapping up our series, Before You Lose Your Faith. Uh, but before we get there, just uh, you gotta know that whether you've been coming for a really long time here to Eagle Brook, or maybe this is your very first week ever checking us out, you gotta know that our mission as a church is that we believe we're empowered by God to reach others for Christ. And as long as there are people who are far from God, who don't have a relationship with Jesus, our work is never done. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're perfect as a church. We believe that we can always get better and we wanna get better. And that's where you come in uh, because every year we uh, give an opportunity for you to participate in a survey, a church-wide survey. So every single campus online are all joining in on this because we wanna find out a little bit more about who you are, but also how we can get better as a church in terms of how we do our mission and how you invite your friends and family members to come join us. And so that's happening right now. And, and we believe so much in this feedback and, and hearing from you that we're actually gonna give you a few minutes during the service to make that happen. So you can pull your phones out right now and text the word survey to 77888. The word survey, text it to the number 77888. And if you're online with us, there's gonna be a QR code that pops up on the screen that you can follow that uh, and join in on this survey. But like I said, we're gonna give you a few minutes to do that with a video that's gonna follow me. But before we do that, I just wanna let you know, maybe you've been wondering, well, why do we have that mission as a church to reach people for Christ? Or why do we do the things that we do uh, here at our church and, and beyond and what's gonna be happening in the future? Uh, we have a class called Closer Look that's 30 minutes right after the service here at the Lionel Lakes campus that's gonna be out in our next step space that I wanna invite you to join us for that. And online, uh, keep your ears peeled from your campus pastor because there's gonna be one coming up soon uh, for online attenders. But we'd love to have you join us right after the service for a Closer Look to dive more into our mission and why we do the things we do. But right now, before we hear from Jason, you're gonna see this video. So take some time to fill out the survey. If it doesn't work, the link will still work work a little bit later this afternoon. You can fill it out. We'd love to hear from you. But check out this video. Enjoy the survey. before I dive in, got some kind of cool news for you. Uh, across the state of Minnesota, there are now eight prisons that are showing Eagle Brook services every Sunday. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Let me read the list to you. Uh, at 10 o'clock, there's like a faith channel, and so we have online services there. These are the eight prisons. Stillwater, Faribault, Shakopee, Rush City, St. Cloud, and Oak Park Heights, and our church has a heart for people who are incarcerated, specifically those who are at a point in life where going, Jesus, I need you. God, I need you. I need a second chance. I need a fresh start. And so if you are at one of those facilities today and you are tuning in with us, just know we are so grateful to have you a part of Eagle Brook Church. All right, today we are in week five and the final week of a series called Before You Lose Your Faith. And as we were brainstorming this series, we started to ask the question, why do people lose their faith? And we came up with kind of the big obvious ones. Maybe they start to drift from truth. Maybe they had a bad experience at a church. 
But the more we talked about it, the more we said, you know, it's not just one decision most often. Most often, it's a hundred little decisions, which is why we've titled today's message, Spiritual Drift. If people don't lose their faith in a day, often it's little by little, day by day, as they simply begin to drift. For the 4th of July, several years ago, our family went up to my wife's grandparents' cabin, and we took their old pontoon out for a spin around the lake, and when we were in the middle of the lake, the engine died. And I don't know what it was. We had gas. That was the first thing. We knew to check that at least. We had enough gas. The engine wasn't flooded. And so I said, let me go take a look. I don't know why. I don't know anything about engines at all. I just was going to go back and stare and go, oh, it looks good to me. But I stepped down, and there was kind of a back ledge off of the boat. It was slimy. It was sludgy. And I didn't realize how slippery it was. And so as I stood on this ledge, both feet flipped out, and I went crashing into the lake. That was embarrassing. But not to be deterred, I jumped back up into the boat, and somebody said, hey, I think the tow rope is maybe around our propeller. I said, hey, don't worry about it. I will go check. Careful not to step on the slimy ledge again, I grabbed onto a seat cushion to brace myself, and what I didn't realize was that seat cushion opened for storage. <laughs> and so as I was holding it, it flipped up, and my weight pulled it off, and I went flying back into the lake a second time. <laughs> now, my oldest sons, if this happened today, they'd still be laughing. But at the time, they were eight and six, and so they still thought I was cool. And so one of my sons said to me, hey, Dad, did you fall in on purpose? I said, no, I, I didn't. My other son thought about it for a little bit, and he said, Dad, did they have you go check on the tow rope because you're the most athletic person on the boat? <laughs> I looked around the boat just to make sure. I was like, I think I am. Thank you for your encouragement. But it wasn't the tow rope, and so we were stuck in the middle of the lake. And my father-in-law and I were just too proud to ask for help. And so we sat there in the middle of the lake in our boat, and my father-in-law goes, shoot, with the way the wind's blowing, we're going to drift back in like 20 minutes. I sat there and stared at the shoreline for five straight minutes. I don't think we drifted one foot. Finally, my wife's uncle, who has Down syndrome and humility... He couldn't take it anymore. He just stood up and he went, help, and started waving <clears throat> to anybody who would come rescue him. And so a jet ski pulled us back to the shore. But here's what I noticed on that day. People don't drift to their destination. People don't drift towards God. In fact, here's really what's true. The easiest way to distance yourself from God is to do nothing. Just do nothing and don't read the Bible, don't pray, don't go to church, don't serve another person or try to reach a person for Christ, just do nothing. Can you think of a time in your life when you were closer to God than you are today? Maybe just a time in your life you look back and go, man, at that time I was so close to God. Reminds me of the couple that was newly married and they had a truck and when they would drive places, the wife would cuddle up next to the husband, he'd kind of put his arm around her, but now it's been, you know, 10 years of marriage, and, and one day the wife looked at her husband and she said, what happened to us? We used to be so cute. We used to drive in the car and we would cuddle. Look at us now. I mean, what happened? The husband looked at her and smiled and said, I didn't move. <laughs> See, the truth is, it's one of those ones that takes a little while to get it. <laughs> kind of just wait for it to build. The truth is, if we have drifted, God didn't move. We are the ones who moved. In the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews addresses this idea of spiritual drift. And in chapter 2, verse 1, he says this, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. How does a person drift? They do nothing. How does a person not drift or avoid drift, they pay careful attention. I was watching a video this week by an author, and he said, he was talking about how people use their time. And he said, you know, people put so much emphasis on a vacation. I got this vacation coming up, and, and they're planning it, and they're thinking about it, and they're stressed about it. He said, the vacation doesn't matter. You're going to do that one time in your entire life. 
He said, what are the things you do every day? What are the things you do for 20 minutes a day, 40 minutes a day? Because at the end of your life, when you add those up, that, that's your life. He said, pay careful attention to what you do every day. If you have lunch every day, pay careful attention to who you're having lunch with and if it's an enjoyable experience. He said, if you drive in the car every day, pay attention to how you use your time in the car, that our life is made up of our daily habits. Let me ask you, do your daily habits bring you closer to God or do they pull you further away? The writer of Hebrews was writing to believers because he understood it was possible to believe in God and yet neglect God because you're paying attention to something else. In other words, it's possible to be so focused on graduating that we're drifting. It's possible to be so focused on starting up a business or our career that we begin to drift. It's possible to be so focused on a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or how your kids are doing that we're spiritually drifting from God. And it's possible to be a pastor who gets focused on church and begins to drift. Here are the two words that I think describe drift the best. Drift is subtle, and drift is incremental. In other words, this isn't dramatic. People don't, aren't renouncing their faith, but little by little, day by day, we moved. Until one day, we look up at the shoreline of our life, and we go, wait a minute, how, how did I get over here, God? Well, here's how we got here. Small drifts can produce great shifts. So here's what I want to try to do today. I want to try to ask the question, how do we avoid spiritually drifting? Because the people in my life that I know who said they were Christians and now today they're like, no, I don't think I am. It didn't happen in a day. It wasn't dramatic. They didn't lose their faith in, in just one single moment. It was a bunch of little moments. It was seasons, years of drifting away from God. How do we avoid that? Here's the first way I think we can avoid it. <clears throat> and it's to <clears throat> avoid isolation. So the author of Hebrews, he goes on, he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Going to church, watching church online, that's a habit. You're either in that habit or you're in the habit of filling your weekend with other activities, but either way, it's a habit. The question I wanna ask you today is this, which of those two habits is going to bring you and your family closer to God. There's just a study that came out within the last month or so, and it was done by Harvard. And they were studying deaths by despair. Deaths by despair are like depression, things like that. People who just get to this point in life where they are in despair. And what they found was that there was one activity that would reduce deaths by despair by 33% among men and 68% among women. What was this one activity that would do that for people? It's going to church on a weekly basis. This wasn't a Christian organization. This wasn't a church that put this on. This was Harvard University studying despair in people and finding, wow, there's this one activity that will reduce it by 33% in men and 68% in women, and it's going to church. Remember that drift is subtle and it's incremental. When your son or daughter is 10 years old, maybe it doesn't seem like that big of a deal to come to church, but I'm telling you, when they're 18 and they start making some destructive choices and they're spiraling away from God, I talk to parents all the time who will say to me in that moment, man, I wish I would have made some decisions years ago. I wish we would have started coming to church regularly years ago. Post-COVID, my wife and I started to notice that our kids would say, hey, can we just watch online? And I don't know about you, what online church is like for you, but here's what it was in our family. One of our kids is over like fixing breakfast. Another one's like on their phone, like trying to go like this under the blanket. Another one's trying to get their big toe in their mouth. And you're just like, hold on, are you, are you paying attention at all here? And so I said to my wife, I said, hey, we have to lead the way. We, if we don't bring them to church now, what hope do we have that they're going to want to go on their own when they're in college? Christine Kane, who's written a book called How Did We Get Here? She says this, she says, the connection to my church family 
Help me stay anchored to Jesus and not drift far from his purpose for my life. She says, hey, there was one thing that just anchored me every single week and helped me not drift away from God, and it was coming to church. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I went to a Thai restaurant, and when we walked in, there was nobody there. That's not a good sign. When you go into a restaurant and there's not a single customer that's there, the, the waiter who was behind the bar, he came around, and I have never seen someone so annoyed that a customer was coming into their restaurant. He just kind of rolled, he's like, oh, geez. And so he seated us. The service was terrible. <clears throat> the food wasn't great. We won't go back. But here's what we didn't do. We didn't say, you know what? I'm done eating out. Had a bad experience at that restaurant one time, never going back to another restaurant again. I will talk to people who will say, hey, I had a bad experience at church, and I'm just, I'm done. I'm not going to church. Nothing to do with organized religion. And I'll say, that's like saying you had a bad experience at a restaurant and saying I'm never going to eat out again. I mean, I understand maybe not going to that particular church, but, but find a different Bible-believing church that you can become a part of. The other pushback that people will have is they'll say things like this. You don't need to go to church to be a believer because God is everywhere. Have you heard people say that? You don't need to go to church. God is, God is everywhere. You can just go for a walk out in nature, go to the golf course, whatever you want to do. It, it, it doesn't matter. Here's the tricky part about that phrase. It's mostly true. God is everywhere. And technically, you don't have to go to church to believe, be a believer in Christ. But here's my question. If you're a believer in Christ, why wouldn't you want to be in a place like church? Why wouldn't you want to worship with other people and hear teaching from God's word? This is a false dichotomy. Jesus never said, hey, it doesn't matter. You don't need to go to church. The Bible says, do not give up the habit of meeting together. Because coming to church isn't just about us. It's about the people we see. It's not just about what we can get. It's about what we can give. I mean, yes, you can listen to the message on a podcast. You can listen to it while you run or while you commute to work, but you can't serve. Can't drop your kids off in a place where they're going to learn the Bible in a way specifically designed for them and make friends. You can't sing with hundreds of other people and be inspired in that moment. You don't get an hour free of distraction, just you and God. I remember when my wife and I were newly parents and we came to church, we were so grateful for the volunteers in our kids' ministry. I mean, we would come in, bags under our eyes, our son or daughter is just having a meltdown. And we would just be like, you take them. <laughs> and we were so grateful. I mean, I remember one time I walked away and like high-fived my wife. And I'm like, I can't believe this. And we came into church and we were able to sit and hear teaching and get restored and we were excited to see our kids when we picked them up. You don't get that in other places. I'm so grateful for those volunteers who said, you know what? We want to use our gifts. I'm so grateful those volunteers didn't say, oh, I don't need to go to church to, to believe in God. Or, well, it's just easier to stay home. They use their God-given gifts to serve their God-given purpose. And I want to invite each of us to do the same. Here's the second way I think we can avoid spiritually drifting from God, and it's this. Check your intake. If you watch an hour of the news, or even like a half hour of the news, your anxiety level is going to go up. Man, almost guarantee you, you're watching all the things happening in the world, and you're like, oh, no, 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 and your anxiety level is going to go up. I was watching the news several years ago. I'll never forget this guy. He was like the, the broadcast. He leaned in. He looked right at the camera. He said, don't you worry. We are going to get you through this. I was like, you're not going to get me through anything, click. <laughs> now, let me just remind us that they want the news to be a bit sensationalized so you feel like you can't turn the channel, which is going to boost ratings and attract advertisers and make money. There's nothing wrong with that, but the news isn't going to get us through anything. You may want to jot this down if you're taking some notes. What we watch or listen to will determine what we think. And what we think about determines who we will become. This is the law of exposure. What we watch or listen to, what we take in with our eyes, what we take in with our ears is what we're going to think about. 
That's pretty obvious, right? If you're looking at something, if you're listening to something, that's most likely what your brain is tuned into. And what we think about on a regular basis oftentimes determines who we will become. It's the law of exposure. Now, there's three words that some of you have playing in your mind right now, and here's the three words. Doesn't affect me. Music I listen to, it doesn't affect me. I don't even listen to the lyrics. I just listen to the beat. TV shows, movies that I watch, that doesn't really have any effect on me. Now, on the one hand, I understand this line of thinking. I could watch a violent movie or a movie with some violence. I'm not going to go out and commit a violent act. Never necessarily subscribe to that kind of thinking. But I also believe that people underestimate the law of exposure. The law of exposure is as predictable as the law of gravity. Nobody steps off a ledge, falls 10 feet to the ground, and goes, gee, what was the odds of that happening? But people violate the law of exposure all the time. And then they're surprised when their life goes in a negative direction. John Morant is the 23-year-old basketball player who plays for the Memphis Grizzlies. And a few months ago, John Morant went on Instagram Live, and he was seen waving a handgun. And there's a bunch of other things going on in the background as well. The NBA suspended him for eight games. Afterwards, they asked Patrick Beverly, <coughs> Pat Bev, who used to play for the Minnesota Timberwolves, they said, hey, why do you think Morant would do that? He's young, he's got you know, wealth, he's got this huge future ahead of him. What do you think would cause him to do something like that? And I'm going to read to you Pat Beverly's quote. This might be the only time Pat Beverly is ever quoted in church, so this is a historical moment <laughs> happening here. And I've edited this for the sake of church as well. This isn't the exact quote. He said this, I think music has a lot to do with this. I thought, well, that's interesting. He said, especially with this culture, everyone holding a gun in the music video is okay. Bling on your teeth is okay. Pants half down your butt, that's okay. Sad to say it shouldn't be based on our music, but it mostly is based on what we listen to, and that's how it is. Now, is he right about this? I, I don't know in this specific instance with John Morant if that you know, played into it at all, but here's what I do know. People underestimate the law of exposure. People underestimate, even believers in Christ, underestimate what they listen to, what they watch, and how it begins to affect their life and their heart. Here's what Jesus had to say about this. Jesus said, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy... Your whole body is full of light. Let me ask you, how healthy is your eyesight these days? You can have 20-20 vision and have unhealthy eyes. Because your eyes are taking in images that are going to have a negative effect in your thinking and your heart and your soul and your whole life. Jesus said, your eye is the lamp to your body. You got to check your intake. People who drift from God often start watching things, listening to things that pull them away from Jesus Christ, and that often is the first step. In Jeremiah chapter 2, God is speaking. He says, my people have committed two sins. Number one, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water. Number two, they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold water. What is, what is he talking about here? Well, a cistern was a container used to capture rainwater. It was something they would use to capture rainwater for drinking purposes. Notice the dichotomy here. God is saying there's a spring of living water. It's always bubbling. It's always fresh. You can have it whenever you want. It's a relationship with me. And God's people were like, mm, don't want that. Not going to take advantage of that. We're going to go over here. We're going to build our own cisterns. We're going to build our own life without you, God. But there was cracks, and it ran dry, and it left them dissatisfied. How does this apply to our lives? It strikes me that many people try to fill their life up with something, like pleasure, success, entertainment, but it's a broken cistern. It leaks. It leaves a person dry. I was watching the Minnesota State High School hockey tournament this year, and Minnetonka beat Edina 2-1. to one. I had someone last night yell out, like, woo! 
I was like, I'm from Wyzetta, whatever. I don't like Minnetonka or Edina. I just want to see you lost. But here, here was the game. Minnetonka won two to one, and at the end of the game, it was striking. Because the Edina kids skated out to center ice, they took off their helmets, and they were weeping. It's one of the saddest scenes I've seen in sports. Their hands were in their face, arms around each other. You just think they've spent their whole youth hockey career hoping and dreaming to win a state championship. And they fall short by one goal. 20 yards away, the Minnetonka team is hogpiling each other, and it's this scene of pure joy. Joy and despair 20 yards apart. John Anderson, the head baseball coach for the University of Minnesota, he says, if you're looking to sports to fill up your life, if you're looking to youth sports to fill up your life, he said, you're going to be disappointed. What, is he, what do you mean by that? He said, it's a broken cistern. One moment you might be riding high, but the next moment you're going to be riding low. You're going to be in total despair. It won't ultimately satisfy Jesus says, there is a spring of living water, a relationship with me that can fill you up and satisfy your soul. In Revelation chapter 2, <clears throat> Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus. He says this, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Do you remember the love you used to have for God? Maybe when you were first a believer and you were just so excited about church, you were so excited about God, and you were so excited about reading your Bible and what God was doing in your life and what he was teaching you. And then he says, over time, for some people, they start to lose that. They start to forsake the love they had at first. He said, consider how far you've fallen. Look at the shoreline of your life and, and, and go, wait a minute, how, wh look at how far away I am now. And then he says these words, repent and do the things you did at first. Maybe a good analogy of this is a husband and a wife. They meet one another. They start to date. They fall in love. The wedding is beautiful, but now it's been 10 years. And they're just doing life together, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a life born out of their love for one another. But they got so focused on the kids and remodeling the house and their career that all of a sudden they, they drifted. They drifted away from their first love. Some advice that my wife and I got early in our marriage was to try to build some times into your relationship to connect. And so we've just called it one by one by one. Once a day, we try to find 15 minutes, a half hour, just the two of us, just to kind of connect and talk. And then once a week, we go out to dinner, we go on a walk, spend a night, just the two of us. Then once a year, if we possibly can, we'll get away even for just a weekend just the two of us. And what I have found is this. Especially when we get an extended period of time to connect, I will look at her and I will start to remember. I will remember my first love. I'll think to myself, oh, I love her so much. Now, it's not like every time we get together, I hear bells and whistles, violins are playing, and I feel all warm and fuzzy. I think she probably does. But <clears throat> I don't... I don't always feel that. <laughs> but given that there's not a bigger issue in our marriage, I begin to remember. Is it too simplistic to take that analogy and apply it to our relationship with God? What do your getaways with God look like? Do you have a time built into your life every single day, 15 minutes, a half hour to go, God, I just need to slow down and be with you. I just need to open the Bible and, and you teach me, God, and speak into my life. Do you have a time non-negotiable every week to be in church, to go, this is going to anchor my faith? And then do you have a time maybe once a year to get away for a retreat or something like that? What do your getaways with God look like? When I was in seminary, I was working full-time, I was going to school full-time, and I started to drift. And I didn't even realize it at first. I just noticed I was irritable with people that I loved. I was really crabby. I was less joyful. One day at the end of the semester, I had to turn in like two tests and a thesis paper. And I hit submit on the second test. And I bent over and threw up in the garbage can. My body had just shut down. So my wife and I drove to the grocery store. We hadn't been to the grocery store in several weeks. We were just too busy. And my wife ran in. I wasn't feeling well. 
And I sat in the car and I looked up at the stars and I thought, God, how did I get here? I, I drifted. I hadn't prayed in months. I was in seminary and I wasn't praying to God to, for my own soul. And so I went home and I remember taking a shower and I opened up to John chapter four and it was talking about this woman who had tried to fill her life up with so many different things, this marriage and that marriage and this relationship and that relationship. And she was empty. And Jesus came along and said, there is a spring of living water. There is a well of living water. It's a relationship with me and it will satisfy your soul. I'll never forget because I remember thinking to myself, I moved. God didn't move. I'm the one who moved. I'm the one who drifted. Let me ask you have, you, have you drifted from God? Over the course of the last six months, the last year, the last several years, do you look at your life and go, God, you know what? I used to be over here. I used to love you and be so close to you. But now today, God, I've drifted. If that's you, I want to ask you to do two things. The first thing is I want you to ask you to look at your daily habits, to look at do you have a time with God every day, 15 minutes, half hour to connect with him? Do you have a non-negotiable commitment to be in church or watch online every single week to go, God, this is going to anchor my soul? And the second thing I want to ask you to do is do the things you did at first. That's what Jesus said to the church in Ephesus. He said, repent, turn around, and then do the things you used to do. If you used to go to BSF, which is Bible Study Fellowship, and it was, you were so close to God, sign up and do it again. If you used to be in a small group or serve and volunteer and kids, do that again. If you used to have a Bible reading plan where you're reading through the whole Bible, then do that again. Do the things you were doing when you were close to God and loving him the most. And here's what I think you're going to find you're going to find that you begin to remember. You will remember your first love. Let's pray together across all of our campuses. <laughs> God, we need you. On our own, Lord, we just drift. And we don't want to, we don't even try to, but we just naturally will drift away towards the things of this world and away from you. And so, God, right now, as we are before you, we repent. We acknowledge, God, the times when we've drifted. Maybe we've even drifted right now. But, God, we want to turn around. We, we want to come back to you and back to our first love. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet us. I pray that you would touch our lives. I pray that you would bring another person or an opportunity into our life that would help us grow in you. God, I pray this week you would, you would speak to us, that you would give us the discipline to build some daily habits, some weekly habits that will allow us to connect with you on a daily and a weekly basis. And God, just first and foremost, I thank you that you are a God who loves us so much that you care when we begin to drift away from you. You notice, God, when we begin to drift away from you and you are pulling us, you are drawing us back to yourself. God, we love you for that. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer for anything at all, come on down front. Next week, starting a new series called While We Wait. I think it's going to be a great series. We'll see you then.